Excellent. Thank you all for being here today. I'm Sixto Wagen and um, just a few housekeeping rules. I, you all, we all have you muted for right now, and uh, but toward the end of the presentation, we'll actually open it up for questions and answers. Um, if you have questions like as we talk, uh, and please just go ahead and use the chat and we'll try to address them as they come along. Um, and a big shout out to uh, Paulette who's doing the closed captioning. So if you all, anybody needs that, just there's a button on the bottom of your screen at this point. And also to Thomas who's handling all of our tech today. Um, okay, um, thank you all for joining us and um, thank you for uh, being here. And I feel hopefully you've been inspired by the entire time at your um, art place and we hope to continue to inspire you. So um, we're gonna start with some bios um, and some grounding. And then we're gonna talk through just the rest of uh, what our history has been together around the fellowship um, and then open it up to where we are right now. So I'm Sixto Wagen. I am the director for the Center for Art and Social Engagement at the Catherine G. McGovern College of the Arts. Um, I answer to he, they pronouns and at CASE, I develop pilot programs, community partnerships and research initiatives that center creativity and community in impact conversations in the 21st century cities. Yeah, that's a lot. Anyway, but prior to U of H, I was a curator, I was a producer, I was a commissioner, I was a performing artist and a queer community organizer. Um, as we will talk about people in place, I would like to acknowledge the work that we discussed today is based in the city of Houston and in the Gulf Coast region, which is in the traditional ter territories of the Sana, Atakapa, and Karankawa peoples. We also recognize that the native peoples share the Southeast Texas region, including the, the Tonkawa and the Kuitikan. What we talk about today is built upon their histories and this land. I'm also employed with the University of Houston that is located in the third ward, one of Houston's historically African-American neighborhoods. Ryan. Um, thank you again so much for um, being here with us. Um, those that are joining and um, those, that have, that, those that have been here. I'm Ryan Dennis. I am um, currently based in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, today I'm actually in Dallas, Texas, but I recently took on a position at the Mississippi Museum of Art um, as a chief curator and artistic director uh, for the Center for Art and Public Exchange. I, <clears throat> for today's conversation, um, was at Project Row Houses for nearly eight years and served as a curator and programs director. Um, my work at Project Row Houses um, and and beyond really focuses on African-American um, contemporary art with a particular focus on socially engaged practices on site-specific projects and public interventions. Um, I was at, again, row houses for nearly a decade and um, this conversation today is um, an opportunity to share about a fellowship that Sixto and I created um, and I am I'm looking forward to kind of getting into that. Um, I guess too, on a personal note, I am a new mother um, of a 14, 14 month old, um, which really gives um, new life and ways uh, to imagine the possibilities within my work. Um, and um, thank and you. Thank you. I'm like, um, and I wish that I'm not very right here. Um, so people in place is really important to Project Row Houses and I think it's important and um, I, for all of us. So for, uh, so that because we just have kind of the, the whole Brady Bunch aspect here, it'd be great if y'all can actually enter into the chat, into the chat storm, actually your name and the place that you are at so that all of us can actually kind of see where and everybody's like where people are from and that we can actually see some names and even though that we don't necessarily see faces, um, we can call out some people and, and thank you for everybody. Thank you, Kevin. And you know, from Micah, I was at your uh, panel yesterday and I see, just go ahead and I, yes, there you go. And also it'd be great in order to give you, a, tell us your favorite food because <laughs> Ryan and I, food. That's what we love food. Food. We are foodies. Hi, Dana. Thank you. Hi, Anne. Hey, Janet. Um, so before we launch into the tech, the talkie talk portion, I also want to name our fellows. Um, and though they might not be in this virtual room with us, their, their presence, their thinking, their work um, 
without them, none of this would be possible. So um, thanks to Carol Zhou, Carrie Schneider, Regina Agu, Yakim Gulilat, Libby Bland, Sarah Rafael Garcia, Nicoleta de la Brown, and Jose Eduardo Sanchez. They are our fellows, but they have a lot of been, been a number of community partners and brain trust members that we will be speaking about later on. Today, we're gonna to be talking a bit about the history and the components and the major learning from our four years within this uh, fellowship. We'll discuss where we are now and what has happened in next steps. And we'll be opening up for question and comments. We're gonna try not to short the hand the conversation, but we have over four years of learning and a really short period of time. Um, so go ahead and continue to add, put any questions in the chat that you might have. And, um, but then we will hopefully have enough time to enter and engage that in the later on. So, um, Brian, you want to talk about the history of Project Row Houses? Sure. Um, so, I think many folks in this room, as this is a, um, a kind of place-based uh, conversation, know about Project Row Houses, so I'm going to give a brief overview. Um, right now, Project Row Houses is uh, a nearly 27, 28-year-old organization located in the heart of Third Ward, which is one of the oldest African-American neighborhoods in Houston, Texas. Um, the organization's mission is to empower people and enrich communities through engagement, art, and direct action. Um, those programs are really, or those kind of spheres of work are um, displayed through, um, for the art component, um, fellowships, residencies, um, the exhibition of artists' work, um, through a kind of um, direct action happens through um, working with our working with the third ward community um, to develop um, uh, housing and existing structures and and a young mother's residential program. Um, there is so much to share about this organization that I think for the sake of time, I really encourage you all to look on the website if you do not know um, about the organization and um, we Project Row Houses released a book that was edited by me called Collective Creative Actions, which um, is available also on the website to really get into um, the kind of interworkings and like the quilt that is Project Row Houses. Um, I think what we'll go ahead and do is just kind of talk about the development of this fellowship program. So <clears throat> I was hired at Project Row Houses in 2012. And at the time I was hired, we had a relationship with the core program, which is um, the, uh, it's a residency program for visual artists and it's connected to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Um, the residency and one of the tasks for, you know, my, my roles was to develop um, a program that situated and foregrounded Project Row Houses and the artist and um, the community that we worked in. It seems it seemed that um, the core program as it was structured was an unsuccessful model for Project Row Houses because <clears throat> we were able to select a group of artists in the second year of them being in the core program. Um, Many of the artists, you know, there, there was there were a number of artists that had um, an interest in community-based practice, but majority of the artists that go through the core program are studio studio practitioners, um, and it was a difficult kind of merge to select an artist who has a studio practice and then has this kind of like short desire to be a part of the third ward community. Um, and so I'd say within a year of me being at Row Houses, um, we dissolved that relationship and with the core program and really started thinking about a fellowship or a residency program that could essentially do um, uh, you know, have kind of connections to uh, the vision of the organization and really situate Third Ward and kind of find ways to work with artists that in fact had and demonstrated the community-based practices for, uh, for the long haul. 
So we um, decided to organize a, um, a kind of brainstorming session. Uh, the, the purpose of this brainstorming session was to, um, yeah, hear from other practitioners, artists, um, people and organizations that we had participated with or partnered with at some point um, to um, answer a set of questions and, and really vision with us what a, what a fellowship could look like. Um, so the questions that we kind of thought about were, what were some of the best residencies and fellowship programs and why? Um, what characteristics made those fellowships meaningful or the residencies? Um, what types of situations and structures did the practitioners find to be most conducive for learning and developing new work and a kind of a new set of skills? Um, we were curious to understand the support systems and tools um, that the artists felt were needed to be a critical, critical to support um, a successful residency or fellowship program. Um, and we really just asked like what the ideal scenario was also uh, could look like for, for artists. Was it time? Was it money? Was it, um, you know, connections to other people in the field, et cetera. So all of the, all of these kind of questioning and our, our two or three day brainstorming session really allowed us to consider a structure and aspects of uh, logistics and really skill building, skill building and understand what um, you know? What could happen at Project Row Houses if um, time and space and mentorship was given in a more formal way? So, at some point, we also recognized that, um, <clears throat> and this was part of our strategic st our strategic plan was um, wanting to have a residency or a fellowship program that connected with an academic institution. Um, for so many years, Project Row Houses um, partnered with the University of Houston um, through various programs. And, you know, from, um, uh, from, from kind of one-off projects to more um, long-term projects, but we recognize that the University of Houston, you know, is in Third Ward. It is an ongoing partnership, um, and we wanted to formalize it in, in so many different ways. So. Um, from that brainstorming session, we came out with two programs. One was this kind of partnership with the Mitchell Center, uh, which is a performing, um, <clears throat> it was a, a kind of performing um, arts um, partnership that we had the ability to commission a major performance-based work with contemporary artists to present in and around Project Row Houses site and in Third Ward. Um, the goal for that was that artists would draw upon the kind of neighborhood as well as the complicated intersection between the campus and the community to um, develop um, curriculum, but also like engagement strategies for uh, with 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 residents and with students um, to then do a project. Um, artists were really selected jointly at a rate of one artist um, per beginning per year beginning in 2006. And then these projects would be presented during this countercurrent festival. And I just wanna acknowledge the artists that we work with was Jason Moran, Ke Kevin Beasley, Oakley Okapolisi, um, and um, my collaborator on that was Pia Agrawal. And then we partnered with CASE, um, which Six O Wagon was the director of, is the director of to develop the fellowship um, that would really allowed us to partner, um, you know, with the institution to um, uh, find ways to really deepen the work of a socially engaged art and, and curriculum and time. So I think I want to pick up there because um, I actually was uh, during the 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 think session, like the three day think session. I was there, um, but as a, as a representative of Diverse Works. I hadn't actually been part of the University of Houston. And so I had worked with Project Rail Houses a number of times. And I think one of the reasons why we wanna stress this is that um, Brian's and my working relationship lasted many years. The relationship between, uh, my relationship with Project Rail Houses lasted many years and the relationship with the University of Houston also lasted many years. It is about these shared projects and these shared programs that have built an ongoing sense of trust and ongoing sense of possibility that we needed to build from. 
And when I came to the University of Houston and I was able to, and then when we were able to transition the, to create the College of the Arts, it was an opportunity for me to rethink the Center for Arts Leadership and really what those opportunities were. We had the opportunity, we also, it was um, Rick Lowe who was able to join, join the faculty at University of Houston. And at that moment, how did we want to think about creative, you know, community engaged practice? How did we want to, as a college, actually center that and, and take advantage of the, not, not take advantage, but, but really be, uh, think about the relationship with Project Rail Houses, which is a mile away from, from University of Houston. And how do we um, support, how can the university support the community organization? Um, what does support mean for a university? And what does support mean for a community? And uh, can the guiding principles for the fellowship be transformative for the center and the college? And again, for me, how can we also acknowledge the fact that this is Project Royal House's legacy and their work? And that as a center for art in the College of the Arts, that we were there in order to help amplify them, uh, amplify that work, help share the knowledge, but really it was their, their knowledge and their expertise that we, wanted, that we were building on and partnering with. And then also, when the, for me in the center, is there, is there a way that we could actually create the center in a, um, as an embodiment of social practice programs? And that like the learning actually resides within the university and actually also simultaneously strengthens the community. Um, how did we actually think about these questions and how, and I guess, again, these, our approach is very much about inquiry and how do we actually think about the questions in terms of the framing? And so one of the things I'm gonna ask you all to do in a few minutes um, after I go through this next session is, is to continue to think about if you had a year in order to spend doing research about community engaged practice, what would your guiding questions be? How would you want to spend your time and what that invest investigation would be particularly um, you know, here in Houston and working with University of Houston Center for Art and Social Engagement and Project Row Houses. And I'm gonna ask you all like in a few minutes in order to share those questions so that we can actually um, uh, hear from you all about what that research might influence. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I think now we're gonna talk about uh, the, the basis of the um, the fellowship and the curriculum and our guiding principles, right? Yeah, so as y'all are thinking about the guiding questions, um, which is one thing that we ask our, <laughs> that we um, put into the application and really um, determined how we were going to select artists for the fellowship program um, from the onset. Um, we, you know, when we started thinking about the fellowship, we recognized that there was a, pro, a real kind of like a proliferation of MFA social practice programs that were pushing a kind of project based approach. And I mean, from my perspective, I thought and still kind of think that that was doing a lot of harm for people to um, recognize like the communities that they exist in, build relationships, um, you know, develop supportive networks and just really sit with like who they are as artists and what type of work they were interested in doing collaboratively. Um, and so we wanted to have a fellowship that was time-based, um, like really allowed for time to um, spend in, in Houston, in Third Ward, with Project Row Houses and with the University of Houston. Um, and we did not ask that um, a project was like the outcome, right? We really wanted you or we really wanted the artists to sit with um, their guiding questions for research and think then if there are resources and relationship building that can happen within this first year, what might a kind of um, project or um, yeah, ongoing um, moments with this community look like in year two or year three? Um, we also at Project Row Houses, um, you know, I'm thinking about some of our guiding principles, but <clears throat> we were in the in the kind of process of really um, codifying a kind of PRH methodology. 
um, and recognizing the kind of nimbleness and like the organic kind of responsive nature of the organization and how things developed. And we wanted to make sure that was included in, in the fellowship um, program for artists. Um, we also were really intentional about this kind of like respectful, again, responsive, do no harm, like being really intentional about the ways in which um, artists were showing up um, with our organizations and in, in, inside of um, Third Ward. And um, again, I think the kind of guiding questions was, a, was an opportunity for us to like set a tone for exploration and not kind of arrive into, you know, um, the, the community with like a certain set of ideas or, or um, assumptions about the place we really wanted them to again spend time to um, explore certain themes and questions and curiosities and then another part of our you know principles for the fellowship was to think about a local and a non-local um, artist right and the the point of that was so that we can already establish like a community with these two artists. So one that has been working in Houston for a period of time, maybe not central to third ward, but like within uh, within this within the city, and then another artist who is from out of town um, and really building up a kind of a period of time for those artists to be each other's like rocks um, while Sixto and I leaned um, on guidance and like, building relationships with folks. <clears throat> um, and I think, you know, I also want to acknowledge the fact that like I and the university wanted to be very intentional in, in, in terms of this because of our long-term histories and, and, and um, the tangled histories that university has had with Third Ward um, and I, some of it and, and recognize that we needed to be the part of the, this fellowship was an, a way for us and the university to listen more deeply and to actually have artists be part of the the advocates for for listening in that in that aspect and and that be a way in order for the university to actually hear it from the, from with artists as well as from community members and create opportunities multiple levels of opportunities for the community to be present within the College of the Arts and within the University of Houston in different ways. Um, I think that I, did we talk about Burn Trust? Because I think that was the other part where, um, I, how no, we, I, one, okay, um, I, I, that's right, that's coming up. I, I think that I, the other elements is that we wanted to make this, pre, uh, this residency relatively low in terms of expectations. They had a presentation at the beginning, basically talking about what uh, th their history of their work and introduced their guiding questions so that our faculty and our community actually understood where they were going and what they were uh, potentially gonna do and how they can engage and possibly help. And then there's the presentation at the end of the year, which was, what did you learn? How did you learn? What, wh how was the learning different from what you initially thought that the learning was gonna be? And the third major component was how could they uh, be part of Project Royal House's uh, summer studios residency and mentor those artists, the seven young uh, undergraduate students that from local universities who had a six to eight week, I'm sorry, it was a 10 week residency within the studios so that it was a, about another generation of mentorship that we were following. There was no other, we wanted to make sure that it was about research, learning, and responsibility, responsiveness. And that part of the thing for us as a university and as, as partners, how can we learn from the learning? And after like multiple years, what are the ways that we can uh, distill and synthesize learning of what community engaged practice needed to be, what our learning and distill practice of where we as a university can partner and partner well and partner equitably. Um, and so that it was not about what our goals were, but how we continue to be part of um, the support in that aspect. So you know, I think it's really important maybe six so to talk a little bit about like the third ward initiative that was um, put forth by the president and also um, Rick Lowe's hire at the University of Houston. 
um, because I, I think that also gives some like context into the university's investment to this fellowship program and how it is going to be sustained, right, in some right. ways. So, you know, there's a lot of times like this fellowship happened um, at the same time that Rick was able to join the fact that we hired Rick to be part of the faculty. And also where the president came up like, with the third award initiative, which was a, a realization and a, a public initiative, um, which was health, um, arts, education and enterprise in order for uh, the University of Houston to be better neighbors with a third ward and how and how de developing big rocks and in major initiatives in order for the university to leverage its own resources as its own expertise and its own knowledge in order to support uh, the community in ways of, you know, in, in terms of the better achievement in terms of education, figuring out different ways in terms of health support. Right. And, and Rick was important and this fellowship are keys in terms of the, the arts component of Third Ward initiative. And that um, as the education component and health and enterprise came up with very specific uh, quantitative um, success goals, we were pushing back for the arts is that this is about responsiveness. This was about us learning and that we're not gonna be able to come up with quantitative numbers in year one or year two. The only numbers that we can say is that we are going to have two fellows every year for this period of time and that we are going to be able to look at their learning and then also from the learning of the fellows help develop an undergraduate fellows program. And so that we can think about place-based practice and uh, through, you know, through in a pedagogical framework and through that learning and through uh, through practice and that we can continue to move forward. So a number of these things happened simultaneously, but they were also fed each other. And I think that continued to demonstrate that we are at the university uh, really more conscientious of what our, what our role is as an anchor institution within third ward and how we can do better. So, um, I think too, it's really um, like, you know, it's, um, I, I have not been at the organization now for six months, but recognizing the um, importance of the anchor institution, right? That anchor institution is the University of Houston to a smaller organization that is Project Row Houses. And it's um, like the ability to have this official relationship that really just amplifies the, the resources and the kind of skill building and the mentorship um, and the ability to connect artists and practitioners with multiple um, like disciplines within the University of Houston, right? So there's this kind of skill sharing, I think that Sixto mentioned. Um, another thing that was really important for the fellowship program um, on the uh, from the onset was the building of this kind of brain trust. And the brain trust, um, I mean, simply defined is, is, a, is a, a group of like three to five individuals that the artist selects um, with six tonized guidance or like suggestions on individuals that they want to build and share with. Um, that brain trust looks like folks that are inside, like established in Houston. Um, it looks like people, individuals who um, want to connect with people outside of Houston, outside of Texas, on the East Coast, on the West Coast. It really is a, um, I'm, it's a supportive network that is led by uh, a relationship that is built from the artists. And those exchanges happened over the course of the year. Um, we did ask that the brain trust members, you know, find ways to at least connect with each other um, once a month. And the brain trust was also um, paid for their time and their relationship with the artist. Um, Six Home mentioned the Summer Studios program and having the artist um, or the fellows be mentors within the fellowship, or I'm sorry, be mentors within the summer studio program was really, uh, really exciting, honestly. The summer studios program is an established program at Row Houses, it is this kind of 10 week um, program that has six weeks of being within a studio and then four weeks of being uh, giving younger emerging artists a four, a four week exhibition. 
And the program has like definitely developed over the time that I was at Row Houses to incorporate this mentorship um, moment, but having the fellows be selected for the mentors um, for each year was really important because together they would work to establish a curriculum based off of the summer studio artists like um, interest and again gave them just another time to like to work together and continue to build relationships but then it was really helpful for the summer studio artists to like a work alongside with uh with a, a practitioner um <clears throat> it was um uh I think the kind of supportive networks with the residents and then third ward organizations such as the Emancipation Economic Development Council and the third ward community cloth really allowed for some grounding of, um, of, of uh, work that was being done at a pretty hyper local level. And then um, I think another kind of learning was just the understanding that there truly is a need for fellowships that like platform the values um, we set out and gives a framework for um, the organization that Project Row Houses to think about building this kind of PRH institute at some point in the, um, in, in the future. I think that um, uh, as we're talking about like, we're consciously creating um, concentric circles of, of trust and communities of practice. And how do we continue to like look at that not only from a like bringing in more aspects of the university, uh, bringing in more aspects of the community, and the brain trust was one of those ways to personify um, how do we bring the arts community, the university, and um, the com uh, and project row houses and, and and the community itself, and and the residents as a way to support the artist and how can the artist identify those ideas? And, I, and hopefully, how can those relationships with the artist last longer than the fellowship? And how can the relationship of the brain trust actually last longer than that fellow? So continuing to build up um, these stronger direct personal relationships that were, um, that I think are the ways that we are really going to make um, structural change within our relationships and actually be able to support uh, something substantive over the long term. So I, I, now I think is a time like we're talking about the brain trust. It's now a time for you all to share with us what would have been if you had the opportunity for a year of research to do this, what would be your guiding question or questions? And if you put those in the chat and then we can kind of acknowledge those. And after the, like the chat storm there, um, we're gonna do a little bit more about summary of the learning um, that we've had and then open up to general questions. So um, what would it be your research questions? Jane, thank you. Um, interest, interrupted in policy making process key to making change in our society, yes. I, what kind of coursework is being offered? Okay, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in terms of coursework in a second and, uh, and lawmakers, lobbyists, really important questions about uh, creative and human aspects. Yes, um, Carolyn, uh, who is benefiting the community practice and how do you measure successful projects? Also, and we'll get to that in a second. And how do we foster complex communication without alienation or othering? Other questions that you all would be interested in participating and, and pursuing if you had a year of just time of, of research and support. I forgot, like, I don't know if we mentioned this before, but every fellow gets $15,000 for research plus 5,000 for a, a research budget. And then the out of town person also gets a travel budget. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, how do engagement processes create community agency? Really significant questions there. I, Kevin, thank you. Um, what do, was true co-design and co-equal collaboration between institutions, orgs, and community partners look like? And how might funders, institutions honestly, uh, honestly balance their own agendas and desired outcomes with community members' needs and priorities? Sorry, I just want to sit with that one for a long time. But um, that's a uh, Kevin, how did you know that? Like, you know, have you been in, in, like, have you been reading my mind or being experienced in the past? <laughs> few months. Um, that's a, a really interesting question, particularly um, in this next moment. But um, we, 
We'll get to that in a second. So I think that um, I'm going to talk a little bit about from the framework of the, the college and actually ideas about success. So the, the questions about successful the measures of success has been really challenging for us. It has been um, a, a point of uh, of a lot of pushback from the university, a lot of pushback from community, not pushback, but investigation from community. Because this isn't like what we have been talking about. We've been investigating, we've been investing in relationships, we've been investing in research, we've been investing in, 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 in process. And I don't think that we can actually judge the success of process after a year. Um, I don't think that we can judge, like, you know, it, it was hard, like, I think that that's part of when um, our pushback with everybody and with the university is that if we're actually engaging in deep relation, deep listening and, and relationship building, then we are not going to learn what success might look like within a, a calendar year or an academic year. It is about investing in a long term uh, ideas and continuing to build in trust and, and support about where we can move forward. So part of our approach has been, uh, instead of defining success after one year, instead of designing it after two years, is really after a three year period, we've actually brought in all of the fellows together during the summer in order to look at um, what has been the learning from the first year over multiple years. Yes, Ryan. I just wanna clarify that we brought them in last summer. So oh. Right, like year three. Yes. Uh, just, not this past summer. But not, yeah. and you know, during the pandemic, a lot has actually <laughs> shifted. Lots changed. Um, but well, but six still we'll talk about that. So I think that, you know, but basically it was like, how do we then build a, a, a community of learning and like bring everybody together and then also learn from their experiences, not only with it, during the fellowship, but years after the fellowship. And how can we as a community start thinking about that? What we are now doing is that we're also have uh, built in a relationship with the, the our, we are starting a relationship with our graduate school of social work um, in order to be thinking about uh, uh, more community based processes and have um, multiple proposals out in order to look at what that might look like uh, with a more formal uh, 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 research process in this aspect. But now that we've actually done this for four years, we feel like we have better questions and better ideas of what we can actually measure and where we actually, like what our measurements need to be into. And that's what's gonna be guiding our relationship with this uh, graduate school. Um, we also have been able to, like what we can also say that success is that all of the fellows during their time period had a, a number of aesthetic and leadership breakthroughs. They actually have done a lot of research, and you know, as Carrie has mentioned that, uh, and Carol mentioned that they had enough time to have, a, like, they had a, enough basis of research for seeds for the rest of their career, and that this opportunity was significant for them to be open and have a time that they didn't have to think about um, what was next, but be responsive, and that um, so that is a success measure. It's also a success measure that we've been able to, to uh, work within the university to demonstrate that, to build in um, an undergraduate under fellowship program and that they are now fund, like helping to fund a, a small version of this, which was actually start, supposed to start last year, but the pandemic um, put everything out on hold in that aspect. Um, and that we also are looking at place-based pedagogies and really thinking about how, uh, how do we and the college, how a case actually com connect with other communities within, um, within the university, like the Center for Public History, women, gender sexuality studies, comparative cultural studies, and actually start developing um, shared understanding of what community based practice is and how that and, and works across curriculum and across the university. And we are still in the early stages of that, but I think that the conversation is now uh, more open and more uh, open to creative process and, and where art is than it, would have been, than it was when it, like three years ago. Um, we also have um, Sara Rafael Garcia who actually took her, her, um, her process uh, in the residency and translated that into a curriculum that she was able to bring to Chapman University last year. So that's kind of some of the success measures that we have. 
I'm going to speak to COVID right now is that um, we had the undergraduate fellows that were ready to kind of launch and they spent a, a semester in Rick's class of community engaged practice and they were going to develop uh, projects and programs in relationship to cultural loop in order to, to, uh, to enact last, uh, last spring. We had essentially three weeks of uh, engagement in order to think about what that might look like. And then we um, had to call the entire project off. Uh, or postpone it in order to uh, leave time and safety for the students and also understand where the community was at. We were trying to be conscientious of them. And then, um, I, and then also we, we put a pause on the fellowship for Jose Eduardo and Nicoletta. And we just told them to not worry about anything, not worry about, you know, they're still getting paid focus on their health, and then we'll just continue to respond to the, you know, be in touch, but understand what's happening. I think that what we also learned for them with the guiding questions were really important because it allowed Nicoletta um, and Jose an area to focus on during this pandemic. And that Nicoletta was very clear that during this moment that her, her work in terms of healing self and, and, and ritual and self-practice that the guiding questions that um, she developed for the fellowship allowed her to find the way through the pandemic and centered her more deeply in her own practice. And I think it, it is now, she says that she's in a completely different place with it and, and is actually able to share out differently. And she was part of a Washington Post article a few months back in this. Um, as the university has started back, the fellows have started back and we're still understanding slowly to try to understand what the needs of the community are. And Jose has actually been engaging in um, uh, third world residents around community refrigerators, thinking about food, thinking about needs for food and actually understanding what, what is need, what is want and hoping to engage in conversations about that. We are still in early stages of this and with the rise of COVID numbers again, we are again trying to be conscientious of this. And, um, and so we are going to pause and in terms of like the, we are going to rethink part of the fellowship, part of this conversation and our place and part of the conversation locally is that um, we are shifting the fellowship most likely next year, um, pushing the, the deadline, the, the timeline back um, and actually focusing on a potentially local and only local um, for, for a year um, so that we don't have to deal with travel and we don't have to deal with that aspect. But also well, say something. Sure. Um, again, and um, you know, I, I've not been at row houses now for six six months. So understanding that there has been being a shift taking uh, taken for the sake of COVID um, is um, is obviously a, a good direction. And I, I I guess what I'm trying to say is, <clears throat> excuse me, my thoughts are getting all jumbled. I think think considering the local like the local um, impact on this fellowship program is really interesting because I'm not too sure how many people in this space or in this room um, understand there is a kind of disconnect in some ways about community community based kind of socially engaged practice in in Houston. Um, then I think in many parts of the country right so in some ways establishing a more kind of local presence for artists to more deeply engage with um, not only the third ward community, but if they were engaging in other communities throughout the, throughout the city, I think it is really important and will set and has set a kind of tone for, um, for the ways that artists work within uh, the Houston community. There is this kind of, um, there is a, a, like an economy that, or like, you know, monetary questions and concerns and like desires for a lot of artists in Houston that um, tend to lean towards studio-based practices. And I, I just think, um, I'm happy really to hear that there will be a kind of centering um, of local artists for the fellowship program because it is something that I've noticed that needs to be developed and, um, and nurtured right um, throughout the city. And I think that that's one of the things where um, 
we are finding that the fellows yes. and the local fellows and even like the relationship with the national fellows have have changed uh, some of the, the dialogue and some of the questions and and really actually provided not only like a, a number of other local artists um, different opportunities to think about community engaged practice and actually acknowledge what they do in, in different ways but also um, they're actually able to hold each other accountable in different ways as well now that we have like you know because of this as as a part of the model so um we've talked a lot and then a lot of talky talky in this aspect um and i think that i you know it's now unless ryan do you have anything more I, otherwise i was going to open it up to q a no i think i think um, getting into some of the q a is important before our time's yes. up time's up um but I, I mean, thank you for all this. I think that we're, we're all continuing to learn. And, um, and I think uh, as we are, we're doing getting better in terms of asking our own questions. And of course, those questions lead to a thousand other questions, but hopefully um, we now have a, a stronger community of support who's asking uh, smarter questions and actually looking for answers with us. Um, other questions, you wanna put it in the chat yeah. or open up? So if you want, I'll go ahead and select. I think we have about time for a few questions. Um, I I am young, but I am like a 80 plus year old on Zoom. So I apologize <laughs> in advance. Um, okay, I'm going to ask a question from Carolyn Naif, who is benefiting from community practice? How do you measure a successful project? How do we foster complex communication without alienating or othering? Is that your guiding question or is that a question that you have about this, like the, the development of a fellowship program like this, Carolyn? You can unmute and speak if you like. Those were guiding questions, um, but if they apply, then... I think that they're really great guiding questions because I don't <laughs> think that we have any answers at this point. I think, you know, like we, 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 we are, I think that we are, we're figuring out certain processes um, and, and, uh, and, and acknowledging how, how better, like how we can practice better. But I don't think that we are actually also like identifying on um, single single ways and single solutions, because I think that we are being cognizant of what is working within one part of the community within Third Ward or one part of the community with the University of Houston is not going to be the solution that needs to be applied everywhere. And I think that, that that multiplicity and that complexity is something that we're trying to, we're encouraging other people to lean into. And again, focus back on what has been the process and what has been the, like, and how do we think about that so that we actually are looking at the skills of the process and not necessarily fo focusing on the answer. I will answer this question that like, um, about how we measure a successful project. Um, I think the fellowship program, because it starts with a set of questions for me, um, what was successful about having an artist like um, really exp expand and like do the research throughout the year was um, was kind of a was a measure of success just in terms of like not that anything was potentially resolved by the question, but having the ability to be in dialogue with individuals that they might not have been um, in conversation with, or um, I will say an example, say from Regina Agu, who is now based in Chicago, actually. Um, she was really curious about the um, Emancipation Park. So in general, her practice is about um, land and environment, like ecological concerns and, um, and like, yeah, like, entities um, that reside in park spaces, et cetera. So the El Dorado, uh, not the El Dorado Ballroom, Emancipation Park is one of the oldest, is the oldest park in Texas. It was um, 
purchased by freed slaves in Third Ward for $800 after emancipation. And um, Regina was really exploring. So let me back up a little bit. Um, in 2015, 2016, the park <clears throat> went through this $33.4 million renovation in Third Ward. There was a lot of tension within Third Ward because the question was like, if there's $33.4 million that can go towards this park um, and it's a 10 acre park, like how could those funds have been redistributed throughout the community? Um, so many things. The park after it opened post renovation was has been really kind of policed in various ways. And so the neighborhood, the residents don't feel like they can just kind of like go to the park to have a picnic with their family or the, the way that the park was used previously has changed drastically. And so Regina was really curious to explore like how the how the how the park functioned um, as like a real kind of safe space for community residents uh, from the beginning to where it is now thinking about like policy thinking about um, thinking about the city of Houston as the as an entity um, to just like explore the way that it functions now. Um, I think her her exploration lend, lended itself to for project row houses to have a better way to like advocate for um, residents to use the park. Um, she just was able to uh, dig up archive images that um, could be useful for the way that the park, um, engages and programs in the future. So it really set a tone, like the, the kind of gu the guiding questions and the relationships that are built throughout the year as in just a Regina Agu example really sets a tone for um, new possibilities of like exploring something that has been there but no one actually really understands like the beauty of this, of the park, right? Um, as like, in practice, right? So there's like theory and then like putting things in practice, I think were, were, were really important. And I think, you know, for me too, sorry if this is a tangent, but just in, in this moment of COVID, um, this question of like, what, how are things measured from success? I just keep wondering like, who's, 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 who's doing like the measuring, like, who are we responding to with this question sometimes? Um, and maybe I think in some ways the fellowship, like from my perspective, the collaboration with Six Toe allowed us to um, maybe decenter in some ways how like success was measured in the most traditional forms. Um, yeah, I think that you know, you know part of the other things is that we were. Um, Exactly. It's like, like how we can pull it. Like also the fact that um, because of this fellowship, because of the name of the relationship with Row Houses and University of Houston, Regina had a different like positioning and of power and relationship within the, that conversation. And the same with these fellows, and they're able to actually come into different rooms and different spaces. And I think that them and the questions that they're able to ask. I think have actually been really important in order for us to continue to reflect on as we move back to uh, mm -hmm. uh, into um, what does that mean for the university? What does that mean for the, the people who are following in terms of the other aspect and the other fellows? And how mm -hmm. do we continue to build a network of, of relationships from the previous fellows with our, within our current and continue to just, again, build other con uh, sen sen um, communities of practice that make sense? Um, um, I, did you want to ask a question? I see one in the chat, but should I repeat the question or would you like to ask? Oh. As you consider that, Roberto, um, like I, I did put in, like there's a Google document that I put in there in case anybody wants to continue a conversation or stay in touch with us um, and or ask questions and stay in touch with each other around this. Um, Bedoya, did you want to ask it, or is this is, was that a, a, a guiding question? No, I me. Mean, I just have questions. I don't know if they're <laughs> really I'm like Bedoya. I'm like, thank you. Like uh, all, uh, Ryan and and Sexto, uh, I applaud you. This sounds like a wonderful 
uh, project, uh, and I trust your leadership. I'm going to be really blunt about race and racism, and how does it have to two people of color leading this, and how do you unpack whiteness as a dominant ideology that is in the field of social practice, is in the field of planning, it's in the field of creative place making. How do you, as leaders, kind of do your your juju around that? Um, I, I can say that I, part of what it has been is that I, my, the, the positioning of CASE and this fellowship has been really essential in terms of the College of the Arts and its new and its investment in its, in its own anti-racist practices over the course of the past few months. And the fact that we have this relationship with row houses or we have this relationship with community, we have this practice and this process-based practice that we've been able to turn into and utilize to the university in order to question its, the College of the Arts specifically, to question its own like, like questions of like, uh, whiteness and, and colonization. And it has been very hard conversations, but it has been important, uh, I guess, this fellowship has been re important in terms of grounding and demonstration that this is this is why we do the way we have done it. And this type of work and these values and these questions have been really important in terms of this moment within the college and, and how they're trying to move forward. And, you know, from my perspective, Roberto, I mean, I think Sixo and I sit in very different seats because he is a, he is connected to a university that um, he might have to push a lot harder on anti-racist practices just based on the nature of being at a university. Whereas um, my work at Row Houses um, was to really service people of color and within a neighborhood that is predominantly um, African-American. Um, I mean, Sixo and I are two people of color. I'm a black woman. Um, and the way that we maybe informally, like, or just organically also situate um, race in our like practice of being like as humans in this America is um, I think no doubt kind of came out in the relationships that we would, um, or the people that we wanted to make sure artists were connecting with and, um, you know, sharing of text or, um, you know, from perspectives of people from of color and really being mindful of that. But I mean, I don't wanna, I think it's a really great question. And, and maybe in some ways, I think just because of, you know, like being a black woman, it's, it's not, I don't like push that because it's just part of my like daily practice. And so the ways that that shows up, um, I don't, I don't know how to, I don't know how to, how to explain it so formally. It's just like part of the connection and relationships um, and the way that, you know, words are communicated and care is shown and sensitivities are given um, because that's just part of like my life and the existence of like where I am in my seat, right? Um, and Project Row Houses is an organization that values that, but it's more than a value because it's part of the ethos and just kind of like the founding of the organization. And so that is just like always inserted, right? It's a good question. I, you know, I- um, Well, I, I asked it because- way I, I can answer that. No, I asked it because I think both of you through your conduct and through your grace and through your care, kind of do that dislodging as you walk through that world around, you know, how whiteness as a dominant ideology gets in the way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I Thank think you. we're always kind of like just decentering that just because of we are we are people of color living in, in a country that has this historically oppressed, you know. Um, other people of color and, you know, people of, of lower class, and et cetera. So but thank you for that question. And I'm thank you for time for one more. 
And if not, if not, I think that yeah, um, there is the, there is the the Google shared good document in there. If anybody wants to connect to this, and thank you, Roberto. Thank you, everybody, for your time. And again, I just and thank you, Ryan, for um, for being uh, such a great partner in all of this um, and an I miss inspiration. Miss you so well. much. Miss yes. you too. <laughs> um, and uh, good luck with everybody. I um, look forward to seeing what other what other work you all are doing and hopefully we can continue to build this community of practice nationally thank, thank you all you very all much so for joining us and i just want to say please take care of yourselves during this time that we are all in and um, get ready to fortify yourself as we enter into a week of elections and turn <laughs> up you need to and Take a good bath when you need to, go on a walk, just do what you can to restore because I think it's going to be a pretty intense few weeks. So and go back to some of these, th th that food at the very beginning because, like, you know, some of the chip witches and the pozole and like some of that. <laughs> like, thank you for now giving me some ideas for recipes that I need to actually make in the course of this week because um, thank you all for taking care of each other and, and being here with us today. <laughs>